What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Jermaine's Nicholas representing Big Dogs Gotta Eat, BDGE, fantasy football. As always, week two is officially in the books. Actually, again, like I do with all these waiver wire videos, I actually make them prior to Monday Night Football because I want to have this out for Tuesday morning. So there will be some players that play in Monday Night Football that won't be on this list because I don't know how they did. Uh, I will say prior to getting into the game, who is it? Chicago and Seattle. Uh, Brandon Marshall is definitely got to keep an eye on. If he has a big game, he would be one of my top waiver wire ads. Tyler Lockett is probably available in about 50% of leagues. And uh, who else from the other side? Chicago, the only one I could think of off the top of my head that is probably highly unowned but might have a big game is Anthony Miller. I could see him taking advantage of the depleted Seattle secondary. And y'all know I love Miller, but those are the three guys that I would keep an eye on in tonight's game to see if they would end up making this list. If you want all of my rankings, the master stat sheet that I will be publishing every week, along with a private live stream, which will take place tomorrow night, y'all can head over to patreon.com slash BDGE to sign up. It's just a monthly subscription. Get rid of your Netflix and watch my ass on your TV or on your computer or whatever it is. Patreon.com slash BDGE. That also helps me pay for, uh, I got multiple fucking parking tickets this weekend. I got two. I got a, you know, I went to New, I, w I went into the city and I parked my car at the train stop. Next thing I know, Saturday morning turns into Monday evening and my car is sitting there for two days. I get there, all tickets. Anyways, go to Patreon.com. Please help me pay off all my parking tickets. But let's talk about the top waiver wire ads for Week Three, 2018 fantasy football season. Let's get it. Quick note, all of these players listed are owned in 55% or less of Yahoo leagues. Also, anything I talk about in terms of fab budget is based on a $100 budget. So if you have a $200 budget, just double the amount that I say that I would spend on a player. Let's get into the quarterbacks first. Number one, um, and these are, aren't always in particular order. If you're looking for my favorite streamers, I would just go by the amount that I put on for the fab budgets here. So number one is Tyrod Taylor. Again, Cleveland Browns. I have a feeling he's going to continuously find himself on this list. He is 31% owned in Yahoo League. So he's available in 69% of leagues. What's cracking? Uh, he kind of had a, a disappointing fantasy day in week two, uh, which was somewhat salvaged by a 47-yard the bomb to Antonio Callaway. It's a great, great fingertip catch, man. I tell you what, fingertips tops in the league, I would say, after that play. But the Browns, unsurprisingly, let another one slip through their hands. Could uh, could easily be 2-0 right now. But um, Tyrod would have finished the game with 246 passing yards, a touchdown, an interception, and of course he added 26 yards on the ground, which is a week after he added 36 yards on the ground to his box score statistics, and he will always have this rushing floor, people. Now, in week three, Tyrod will be featured on Thursday Night Football against the Jets. Jesus Christ, NFL. You can't do better than the fucking Browns and the Jets on Thursday Night... Whatever. You gotta be used to it now. Thursday Night Football will always and forever be the worst piece of football of all time. Anyways, Jets travel to Cleveland. Uh, Tyrod is a guy who plays much better at home. When you're looking at these splits, these are over the last four years, if you include 2018 season thus far. As you can see, on the left is the home splits. The right is the away splits. And he averages about three three fantasy points more per game while he's at home, which is the case for Thursday Night Football. More rushing touchdowns, more rushing yards, more passing touchdowns, all that yada, yada, yada. So um, this is someone I will be looking to stream against the Jets defense that just allowed 44 rushing yards and a pair of passing touchdowns to Ryan Tannehill. The Jets are definitely an underrated defense overall, uh, but they're not one that you have to necessarily shy away from. And Tyrod, again, gives you that rushing floor of anywhere from like 25 to 45 yards. And if he adds a touchdown to that, of course, that just helps his ceiling. So he gets New York Thursday night. Then they play at Oakland and Baltimore. And at, uh, at Oakland games, another one you could stream him for. Would I use the number one waiver wire on him? No. My fab spend would be probably between 2 and $5 for Tyrod. Moving on to quarterback number two. And that is the front runner for MVP. Ryan Fitzpatrick of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, bro, owned in 22% of Yahoo League. So his 400-yard, four-touchdown performances have gone unused in probably 90% of leagues. Now, I guess, uh, you know, it's time It's time that we give Ryan Fitz, I don't know what you want to call him, Fitzpatrick, Fitzmagic, Fitzgregor. You see him in that press conference after the goddamn game? Looking like Ryan Fitzgregor over there. It's time that we give him the credit that he is due. We're two weeks into the NFL season, and Ryan Fitz 
Magic leads the NFL in passing yards with 819 yards per attempt, 13.4. Pass completions of 40 plus yards with four of them. Number one in QB rating, 151.5. He has posted back to back, like I just said, 400 yard passing games and four passing touchdowns in both of those games. So naturally, you know, he's going to bust in week three now that I'm finally on board with Ryan Fitzpatrick. His eight touchdowns, his eight passing touchdowns are second in the league, only to Patrick Mahomes. While somehow owning all these categories, he is 23rd in pass attempts with only 61 on the year. This is the same Patrick Mahomes that just threw six touchdown passes against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Who does Fitzpatrick get in week three? Mm, the Pittsburgh Steelers. So Fitz got it done at New Orleans, then any, then against Philadelphia, two pass defenses that many expected to be among the elite pass defenses in the NFL this year. Doesn't look like the case, but Fitzpatrick got it done regardless, and now he gets a Steelers defense that has let up a ton of passing production, especially to a guy like Patrick Mahomes. Um, and I could see them, you know, uh, Fitzpatrick coming out and keeping this aggressive style of play that they've had so far. You know, Patrick Mahomes is throwing the ball deep and, and connecting on a lot of longer passes, and I expect Fitzpatrick to come out kind of on fire and take a lot of deep shots like he's been doing thus far. He's got a ridiculous group of weapons there between Evans, Deshaun Jackson, Chris Godwin, the two tight ends, you know, all this. Um, so you, you look for the Bucks to kind of keep this mojo going. He gets Pittsburgh. Then they're at Chicago and a bye. Obviously, week four is when Jameis Winston returns, but if Fitzpatrick keeps playing like this, there's no shot Winston will get back in the lineup, apparently. Um, but we'll have to see. Uh, would I use my number one waiver on, wire on him? Absolutely not. Would I spend a lot of fab on him? Probably not either. I would probably just throw about 4 to $5 on him. The third quarterback to make the list is Blake Bortles, Jacksonville Jaguars. Yahoo ownership, 28%. The man was on fire in their week to win at home versus the defending AFC champion, New England Patriots. They won the game 31 to 20. Uh, Bortles would complete 29 of 45 passes for 377 yards, four tutties. Importantly, he added 42 rushing yards to go along with that. And it's the second game of the season of only two games that he's gone for more than 35 rushing yards. So you're seeing just like Tyrod, he's starting to inherently have that rushing floor for you. So even if he has a bad passing game, which is definitely a, a probability for Blake Bortles' outcome, he will give you those rushing numbers. Um, and also similar to Tyrod, Blake Bortles' splits, home versus away, are very real. I want you to look at this. Um, he gets his next two games at home versus Tennessee and New York, the New York Jets, before traveling to Kansas City. Um, and we're seeing them give up historic numbers to opposing passers. But let's look at these splits. On the left is Blake Bortles' home games over the last year. And on the right is his away games. 10 more fantasy points per game while he is at home. He had a ridiculous run of games last season uh, while they were at home where he went absolutely nuts. So, you know, they get Tennessee at home, they get New York at home, and then you couldn't ask for a better road game in terms of Kansas City and their horrible pass defense. So Bortles is not just a guy that you want to grab today for this week, but he's someone that you could probably stream for the next few weeks. Um, so Tennessee isn't exactly a pushover in week three, but they haven't looked good and they've allowed multiple touchdowns to uh, both quarterbacks that they faced thus year, multiple passing touchdowns to Tannehill and Watson. Watson had 44 rushing yards. So again, that's something that Bortles brings to his game as well. Um, Tennessee, New York at KC, waiver wire number one, absolutely not, but I would spend probably five to $7 if I need a quarterback for the next month or so. Um, that will wrap up my top waiver wire ads for the quarterback position. If you are enjoying, if you've Found value in the video. If you've enjoyed any of my videos thus far, I would, as always, appreciate a thumbs up down below. All you got to do is just scroll down a little bit. Scroll down right on your screen. Hit that thumbs up button. It's that easy. And I appreciate that very much. If you're listening to the podcast, subscribe. Leave a rating. Leave a review. All that good stuff. I don't really care. It's what, it is what it is what it is what it is. I'm trying to stay unemployed. So the less you do for me, the better, honestly. Anyways, we're going to move into the running backs. Number one on this list is Gio Bernard. Giovanni. Bernard, Cincinnati Bengals, only owned in 3% of Yahoo leagues. That number is going to skyrocket this week, of course. And by now, you know that Joe Mixon uh, will be gone for the next two weeks minimum, thanks to a tweak in his knee that caused him to undergo arthroscopic knee surgery this previous Saturday. So Gio becomes the number one running back, as well as the number one waiver wire pickup this week, especially if you are running back needy, which 95% of people in fantasy football are. You, never, you, you can never have too many running backs, especially starting running backs. Plus, um, if you are going against the Joe Mixon owner in the next week, two weeks, three weeks, you should check your schedule. See if you know if you're facing him. That gives you even more incentive to go after him because it gets your opponent uh, a man down in that sense. So 
Here's what we know. We're looking at these splits right here. While mixing is gone, Geo is getting a fat workload. What we have is dating back to last season, this season, and last season. These are the games Geo played with and without Mixin. So on the left is obviously with Mixin. On the right is without Mixin, but it also includes games that it, it's games that Mixin has not played, plus games that Mixin has had less than five carries. So either he wasn't involved or he left the game early or whatever uh, due to injury. So you're looking on the right side here, and Geo is clearly a dominant force in that backfield when Mixin is out, averaging over 113 total yards, over 21 touches a game, and nearly seven targets he's he's just a high-end rb2 with uh rb1 upside as long as Mixon is out he's getting that workload if he gets into the end zone he's going to give you an rb1 week for sure so fantasy football players uh, i would say also about Mixon's injury is is that like people have this injury optimism right so they say two weeks is the reported timetable first i was hearing two to four weeks three to six weeks now they're saying two to two weeks is the um is the ideal return timetable but i think that's optimistic and i think that's if everything goes perfectly and i spoke to dr jesse morse who i had on the channel in the uh earlier in the summer and he said his personal opinion uh if he had to guess would be between three to six weeks for joe mixon to return now take that as you want it he is a doctor um but he was not he's not on the cincinnati training staff he's not the one who underwent the surgery for mix or anything like that but that was dr jesse morris's opinion he says it's probably going to be closer to three to six weeks so if everything goes perfectly according to plan then mixon can be back in two weeks but uh for now you're getting mixing a uh, geo as a an rb2 for at least two weeks if not more um and, and you'll just have to see so i think i think geo is a great pickup next three matchups are at carolina at atlanta versus miami would i use my number one waiver wire on him yes i would fab spend would probably be between 20 and 25 dollars i would go up to 30 maybe 35 if you are an rb needy owner or if you are a mixing owner um obviously that carolina matchup isn't fantastic uh but tevin coleman just got it done against them and then they play at, at atlanta where i i've basically just been preaching to you all summer uh, all season so far atlanta's defense is just meant to give up passing plays to the running back position we saw it with christian mccaffrey he was one of my top dfs plays this week and i think we'll see that again with geo um in week four so i expect him to catch a lot of passes in week four um and i expect him just the volume to get it done for him in week three as well and then they get miami which is another good matchup at home but we'll move on to uh number two and that is austin eckler of the los angeles chargers owned in 44% of Yahoo leagues right now. Now, he'll probably continuously find himself on this list because I feel like people just don't want to pick him up, and that's obviously because he is the uh, second running back on this team. He's not going to ever be the workhorse, and he's not going to take over Melvin Gordon's touches because Melvin Gordon's been an absolute beast thus far. But Eckler, again, just had another ridiculously efficient game, finished with 98 total yards on 14 touches, um, and that was thanks in part to Gordon actually checking out of the game. He, I think he missed basically the entire fourth quarter uh, with some kind of minor injury that we haven't heard anything about. Apparently, he's, he's fine, and he'll be ready to go for week three, but he did get held out of the game. Um, as they were up big against Buffalo. So that's kind of why Eckler, you know, got up to a 14 touch count, which isn't the norm for him. But again, he's being so stupidly efficient with the numbers that it's hard to ignore. Through two games, Eckler now has 224 total yards and eight receptions over two weeks. That is some good PPR numbers, my, my friends. Um, and he's clearly part of their game plan, and he has weekly PPR flex appeal, even with Gordon in the lineup. Now, they do get a tough, a tough matchup at LA uh, against the Rams, but they did let up nine receptions to Jalen Richard in week one. So I expect the Chargers running backs to continue to be uh, heavily used in the passing game. Uh, but after after the Rams, you know, they get a bunch of great matchups. They play at home versus San Fran, at home versus Oakland, then at Cleveland, then at home versus Tennessee. So if you're a Gordon owner, I think Eckler is pretty much a must own at this point. Um, would I use my number one waiver wire on Eckler? No, I wouldn't. My fab spend would probably be between seven to eight dollars, seven to ten dollars. If I'm a Gordon owner, it would probably be somewhere from twelve to fifteen, um, just so I could really make sure I secure him on my team. The third running back on the list is kind of like a weak list for or a week, a week, week. W e a k w e e k. Week, week for running back pickups. Now we move on to a guy that has fucking no relevance to what I was even saying, but it's Theo Riddick in Detroit. And I hate Theo Riddick. I hate him in fantasy. I, I like literally never want to play him, but there's a reason he finds himself on this list in this particular uh, week. He's owned in 24% of Yahoo leagues. Now, 
He caught nine passes last week, nine of 12 targets in their week two loss to San Francisco. Uh, Riddick is up to 14 catches on 19 targets through two weeks of this season. Now, you don't want him outside of PPR leagues because he does almost nothing in the rushing category, and he's not particularly effective in terms of yardage and touchdowns with, uh, with the receptions he gets. But the Lions are probably going to get washed next week as Matt Patricia gets uh, lubed up and by his old boss, Uncle Bill, Uncle Billy Belichick. And they will be playing at home against the Patriots. So it should not be a pretty one for Detroit, who has not looked good at all this season so far. Riddick, so far, leads the backfield in snaps. And the next closest being Kerryon Johnson, who is still 17 snaps behind Riddick. So Riddick is the guy who's getting the most playtime um, in a game that he should get plenty of opportunities as they probably will trail against the Patriots. So I think he's going to pad his stats uh, PPR-wise in Week 3, and you could definitely find worse flex plays if you're in a PPR league. Next three matchups, New England at Dallas versus Green Bay. No, I would definitely would not use my number one waiver wire on him, and I would probably put between 3 and $5. Uh, if you're in a full PPR and you're a little desperate, then I would throw a little more because I think he'll give you double-digit PPR points this week. And we'll move on to my fourth running back on the waiver wire, and that is Baltimore Ravens suck Allen, bro. He can't suck any worse than he, like, it's not even physically humanely possible, I don't think. A brick wall running the ball. He doesn't make any cuts. He's, he has no wiggle. And then when he's catching the ball, he literally can't move his hips. Like, he can't turn side to side. However, 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 volume is king in redraft. Volume is king. And guess what? Suck Allen is getting that volume. And if you're looking for him in Yahoo Leagues, he's not going to be under Suck Allen. He's not going to be under Buck Allen either. He's under Javorius Allen. And he's owned in 37% of Yahoo Leagues. So he's still pretty widely available. Like I said, I hate everything about this. But with Kenneth Dixon on the IR, he's going to continue to play a very big role in this Baltimore backfield. Now, the entire coaching staff, the entire world outside of Baltimore's coaching staff knows that Alex Collins is very good. For some reason, the Ravens coaching staff just doesn't see it. Every time Collins touches the ball, every time he gets on the field, good things tend to happen outside of the couple fumbles. You can relax, people. Buck Allen, for some reason, is just in the game plan, no matter where they are on the field, no matter what's happening. Um, but that's just, that's it. That's the reality of the situation. Um, and the thing about Allen is like, he's not 100% of any guaranteed spot in the backfield. He's like 75% their goal line back because both of them are getting goal line carries. He's like 85% of their receiving back because he's getting a lot of targets. Um, but he just gets it done at, at different parts of the field and in different aspects of the game. So he's kind of like game script proof as well. So he had, uh, five catches now in back-to-back -back games. So in each game, he's had at least five catches. And he has scored a rushing touchdown in each of those two games as well. So it's not pretty. And he's going to continue to average probably like three yards per target and just run into the back of back of his line and shit like that because that's what guys like Suck Allen do. Uh, but one way or another, he just continues to get it done. If you're going to give him six to seven targets a game, he's going to be an asset in PPR leagues along with the games that he gives you his rushing touchdown. So he gets Denver at home, at Pittsburgh, at Cleveland over the next three. Would I use my number one waiver wire on him? No. My fab spend in PPR leagues would probably be between seven and ten dollars on the higher end if you are running back desperate because you could definitely plug him in and probably expect about double digit ppr points uh in standard leagues you'd definitely be on the lower end of like three to five three to five dollars in terms of fab so uh that kind of wraps up the running backs i know there's other injuries dalvin cook's injury is very very minor apparently if you're a cook owner and you want to be safe and and scoop up latavius murray sure but again he, i think he's still nothing but a handcuff at this point um shady was hurt he like some, I forget what he did with his ribs, but he, uh, he fucked up his ribs pretty bad. Apparently, he's going to try to play through it. Um, in his absence, though, we didn't really have like a clear-cut runner. They're going to be trailing a lot, and no one in their backfield is particularly good at catching the ball. So I would just stay away. This is like a poor, poor, poor man's David Johnson situation where the team is horrible, so you're not going to get a lot of uh, chances, but whoever is in the David Johnson role has like 0.01% of the talent that David Johnson has. So you don't have talent. You're barely going to get volume. I'm just staying away from the Bills backfield altogether, even if Shady McCoy is inactive. And I guess speaking on David Johnson, I know I get a lot of questions about David Johnson. So my thing about DJ is uh, Graham Barfield put up a great stat uh, showing, talking about David Johnson's usage so far and how they are not using him in the passing game appropriately. And that was that was something I should have looked at. I know the offense is fucking terrible, but you should have predicted. Week one wasn't that bad. He gave us like 16 fantasy points, which is fine if that's going to be like his normal or floor game. Week two, you um, obviously should have known that the Rams game was going to be an absolute shit show and they just dominate 
time of possession. They dominate teams on both defensive and offensive side of the balls. I wasn't expecting much from DJ. Obviously, I was expecting more than what he gave us in that game. However, like that, the, the Rams game shouldn't be the reason that you're like, oh my God, I want to sell Johnson. So I'm definitely not selling Johnson for, you know, 70 cents on the dollar. If you can get value for value on David Johnson, you know, give him up for uh, a low end wide receiver one or a low end uh, running back one, then I would probably make the move right now because the offense doesn't look like it's getting any better. However, there are definitely better days ahead uh, for David Johnson. And Wilkes came out and basically said that they're going to start using him more in the slot because normally he's always running routes and he's always in the slot and he's always catching passes. And you would think that would be the case here, right? But they're not utilizing him the same way that they were under Bruce Arians. And that's what made him so valuable in fantasy as a pass catcher. So that that's the issue here. But I'm gonna give I'm gonna give him one more week before I actually start panicking about David Johnson and, and thinking about selling him or putting him on the trading block so far. But I think he'll bounce back next week and I think uh, the 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 schedule gets a little bit easier for him going forward. So I'm not I'm not totally freaking out about Johnson. Obviously it sucks, but um, I'm not ready to sell him for nothing. But we'll move on to the wide receiver position. Before we do so, guys, again, I please urge you to uh, hit that thumbs up button if you are enjoying the video thus far because it lets me know that you like these videos and it makes me want to keep doing them. All right, we're going to move over to the wide receiver position. My number one man, my boy, Keelan Cole, Jacksonville Jaguars. My boy. Let's go. Owning 49% of Yahoo Leagues. Now, y'all know I hyped him up all summer, and then I'm sure after a, a mediocre week one game, everyone was like, ah, I'm going to drop him. So he's, avail he's available in 51% of Yahoo Leagues right now. For a lot of the same reasons that I put Blake Bortles up here, uh, Cole is down here on this list as well. Um, but there's another reason, because one of them is actually good, and it's not Blake Bortles. Keelan Cole is really good. And if you didn't believe me, or if you didn't know why I was hyping up Keelan Cole so much, after this... Sunday's game where he was making catches like he was OBJ, you could probably understand why I liked him so much because he's so capable of making plays like that on a weekly basis, and he's really, 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 really good. So if you were someone who dropped him after week one, I, I'm i sorry. I think I actually might have done that in one of my leagues too, to, to be completely honest with you, but um, you're going to be happy that you held on to him if you did. So in the Sunday's game against the Patriots, he caught seven of eight targets for 116 yards and a touchdown. Now, admit, admittedly, admittedly, Still a very messy situation for the Jacksonville receiving core. Uh, a lot of weapons, seeing a lot of targets, but I think that Bortles just set up how he is. A lot of home games, a lot of easy matchups. I think he's about to go on a little mini tear, which we saw over the second half of last season, and I think Cole should absolutely benefit. And I think after this week, you can kind of see that Cole was transitioned into the wide receiver one in this offense. Now, that being said, I don't hate D.D. Westbrook here either um, to an extent. I definitely don't put him on the same pedestal that I would Cole, um, but he should also benefit from someone that if Blake Borles is going to go big and, and, you know, supporting up big numbers and D.D. Westbrook should be right there as well. Westbrook went four for 83 and a touchdown uh, against the Patriots, thanks to a big 61 yard, you know, catch and run. Uh, but those are the big plays that D.D. is capable of on, you know, any given moment or any given week. So I do like the fact that Westbrook is kind of settling in as a, a big play guy for them and getting a decent amount of volume. Um, so if Borles is going to go off, then Westbrook has uh, a good chance to as well. But I'd much rather have Keelan Cole, of course. But, you know, either will do for now. And uh, I, I think this Jacksonville offense is going to surprise over the next couple weeks. They get Tennessee at home, New York Jets at home, and then at Kansas City. Great matchup. Would I use my number one waiver wire on Keelan Cole? Yes, I would. What fab spend would I put on him? Probably 12 to $15, maybe, maybe 18 to 20 if you are wide receiver needy. And a couple other guys that I would probably use my number one waiver wire on. These are my next guys on the list. And they are the Tampa Bay Buccaneers wide receivers. Both Chris Godwin and Deshaun Jackson. Chris Godwin is owned in just 35% of leagues. Deshaun Jackson in 49% of leagues. So both of them are pretty widely available right now. I don't know how. I don't know why they're still available in the majority of leagues. But literally... Uh, it, it's a dub for it's a dub for most of you guys who can pick them up now. As, as Fitzgod, as Fitzgregor has blown up, so have his playmakers, of course. You know, after going nuts in Week One, Djax, who went I think five for 146 and two touchdowns, he doubled down in Week Two and he did it again. He caught all four of his targets, 129 yards and a touchdown. Now in Week One, Deshaun Jackson was in and out of the lineup with the shoulder injury and the concussion, which explains why Chris Godwin outsnapped him 70% to 30%. But in week two, D-Jax 
got back in the lineup, and uh, he was second on the team in snaps with 34. So Mike Evans was the only wide receiver that played more snaps than Deshaun Jackson did. So it looks like Djax is still the wide receiver too in this offense. Although Godwin is right behind him. He played uh, in 29 snaps, only five snaps behind Deshaun Jackson. And so far he's played on 60% of the team's snaps this season, which for the 400th time uh, this summer, this year, this season, I'm going to tell you if Godwin is playing on 50% of the team snaps or above, he is fantasy gold, which he turned into again on Sunday. He caught five of his six targets for 56 yards and a tug, a little tutty which gives him three straight regular season games dating back to last year with a touchdown. I cannot wait to see what this guy does when he is a full-time player. Now, um, Fitzpatrick has attempted just five throws inside the opponent's 10-yard line. So five five throws inside the 10 zone for Fitzpatrick so far because he's scoring all his touchdowns from like 78 yards out. Um, of the five throws inside the 10-yard 10, 10 line, Godwin has seen two of them. He has 40% of Fitzpatrick's 10 zone targets, which leads the team. And I think that's something that we're going to see consistently uh, stay at that kind of usage rate over the course of the season. I'm sure Mike Evans will get a little more involved, but Chris Godwin is developing into a really nice end zone threat. And uh, those are very valuable targets, obviously, especially in an offense that looks to be pretty high volume in passing and, and very efficient at that right now. So both are great ads if you need wide receivers. Um, they get a great matchup at home versus Pittsburgh, which I already touched on for Fitzpatrick. Um this is tied for the second highest over under for the week in week three it's 52 and a half points and that number should continue to go up as the week goes on and people start realizing it's tampa bay versus pittsburgh and um so it, you know very uh, a lot of shootout potential so these weapons again should benefit from that they play pittsburgh then they're at chicago again where james winston might be back and then a bye would i use my number one waiver wire on them yes i would and i would probably spend between 15 and 20 dollars each on uh on these guys so Got those two receivers, and we move over to John Brown of the Baltimore Ravens. He is owned in 25% of Yahoo leagues right now. He needs to be owned in 150% of Yahoo leagues right now. He does not need to be on the free agent wire anywhere. The only thing ever holding John Brown back was his health, and he looks to be a thousand percent healthy right now, guys. And he's probably the Ravens' best offensive playmaker. Crabtree at the moment seems to be the top possession receiver in Baltimore and for Flacco, but Brown is not far off um, and he's far and away seeing the more valuable targets and he could easily turn into Flacco's number one target um, sooner rather than later he had another big game in week two which he scored a touchdown for the second straight game he had 10 targets in that one which led the team and this is something I tweeted out earlier today so so far in 2018 John Brown is tied for fifth in the NFL with three targets inside the 10 zone He's caught two of those three targets for touchdowns. No other Ravens wide receiver has a target inside the 10 zone. So he's becoming the preferred option down there for Joe Flacco. He leads the Ravens in share of air yards. So he is seeing 33% of Flacco's air yards. Crabtree is the next closest at 20%. His 24.0 average depth of target leads all NFL players that have seen at least five targets. So he's not only getting these end zone targets, but he's getting deep targets. All these valuable, valuable, valuable targets. Now... John Brown, you know, you might not think of him as a great end zone target, right? Like 5'10", 180 pounds, but it's the reason you see Stephon Diggs and it's the reason you see Antonio Brown excel at that part of the field because all three of these guys, Brown, 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 and who's the other guy? Diggs. Brown, Brown, and Diggs. It's a hell of a law firm. It's the reason you see these guys excel down by the end zone is because their route running is so precise and it's so good that in a tight part of the field, like, you know, the red zone, the 10 zone, um, they're able to create separation on a dime and they're able to get open in tight areas and the defense gets very tight at that part of the field because there's not a lot of space. So that's the reason you see John Brown getting these end zone targets and that's why I think they're going to stay because that's just part of his game. He's a great route runner. So they do get uh, Denver next week in uh, in week three. They're at home against Denver, but we've actually seen wide receivers have some, some fantasy success against Denver so far this year. We saw Tyler Lockett and Brandon Marshall both uh, have pretty good games in week one. We saw Amari Cooper tear them up last uh, on Sunday in week two as well as Seth Roberts had a decent game for fantasy purposes so it looks like losing Aqib Tlaib uh, to the Rams actually is playing a much bigger role in their passing game than maybe some I mean I'm sure a lot of people saw that coming but their pass rush is still good their run defense is still good but it's definitely not a complete fade anymore um, and I think John Brown is definitely capable of continuing you know to roll on and be one of Flacco's top targets so they get Denver then they travel to Pittsburgh again which is definitely a game in which uh, there could be a lot of points scored and then they're at Cleveland would I use the number one waiver wire on John Brown it depends if the other wide receivers are off the board it depends how much you need a wide receiver uh, I would probably side with no um, but I would spend somewhere between 10 and $12 of my fab on John Brown. Um, and then Brandon Marshall's on this list. Again, keep an eye out for him. 
uh, depending on what he does on Monday Night Foosball. Next up, we got Teddy Ginn. Teddy Ginn Jr. of the New Orleans Saints. Yahoo owned in 41% of leagues. So we have another uh, big game from Drew Brees again, right? He's sitting at quarterback five right now in fantasy football. Now, we knew, we pretty much knew the Saints passing game was in for a more passing touchdown friendly year in 2018, especially compared to that of 2017. Uh, Brees now has five passing touchdowns through two games which puts him on pace for 40 passing touchdowns on the year, which I don't think he's going to hit 40 passing touchdowns, but 30 seems like a pretty safe bet so far if you're going by this pace, right? Um, and 30 passing touchdowns would be a huge upgrade from last year. Now, Michael Thomas is the clear wide receiver one here, and Kamara seems to be the clear second target in this offense, but Ginn is right there lurking. He's got 13 targets through two games, um, which puts him on pace for 104 targets on the year. He's caught nine of those 13 targets for 123 yards and a touchdown. Now, I tweeted this out earlier today, too. Dating back to 2017, Ted Ginn has seen at least five targets in each of the Saints' last six games, and that's including playoffs. So each of the last six games that he's played in, he has seen at least five targets, and he's actually averaged 6.83 targets a game in those with an average depth of target of 16.1 yards. So he's seeing good volume, and he's seeing deep volume. Um, and that average depth of target is easily leading the team there. So his average depth of target so far in 2018 is 16.2. And uh, like I said, is by far and away leading the Saints in that category. Michael Thomas is running a ton of his routes from the slot. And his average depth of target is at like 7 yards, which is kind of crazy right now. But um, Ginn is actually a tough play in week 3 as they travel to Atlanta. And they don't really give up a lot of shots downfield, right? They don't give up long touchdown plays. I know DJ Moore, in before DJ, you talk about DJ Moore. He had a big touchdown, but that was all yak. That wasn't a big play down the field. Ginn is a medium to high floor play in a great offense with, you know, he's tethered to Drew Breathe, Breeze. Um, he has big upside thanks to his ability to go over the top and he can score on a long touchdown on any given any given Sunday, baby. So um, he gets at Atlanta, then he travels to New York to play the Giants and then Washington at home. So I wouldn't use my number one wi uh, waiver wire on Ted Ginn, and I would probably spend between five and eight bucks if I need a wide receiver. Next up on the list is Geronimo Allison of the Green Bay Packers, owned in 31% of Yahoo Leagues. Now, it's well known by this point that Allison is the clear wide receiver three in Green Bay. Um, and they, uh, he's strung back-to-back -back games together that have been very useful. Um, two games in a row where he's had at least 12 PPR fantasy points. So he's starting the year off very strong. He's played on 75% of the Green Bay's offensive snaps so far this season. Uh, in week one, he went five for 69 in a touchdown. Week two, caught all six of his targets, four 64 yards against a tough Minnesota pass defense. He actually out-targeted Randall Cobb in this one, and he's clearly gaining more and more trust from Aaron Rodgers, and that's going to happen when you catch all of your targets on a weekly basis. So if he keeps catching everything thrown his way, he's going to keep seeing more work in his offense. Now, Allison is carving out a name for himself um, in fantasy as a high-floor, medium to high-ceiling guy. Uh, he's probably a wide receiver three flex play at this point, of course, but I think any of the Green Bay wide receivers are capable of having big games on a week-to-week -week basis, and given that they have Aaron Rodgers tethered to him, their floor is, is pretty safe as well. Now, the uh, Packers' schedule starts to lighten up now as they've, they've played uh, Chicago and they played Minnesota, which are tough matchups. starts to lighten up as they travel to Washington. And uh, I'm, I'm assuming Devonta Adams will see a lot of Josh Norman, which means it could be bigger days for the other wide receivers here. Then they get two great matchups where they play at home against Buffalo and then at Detroit. So it's definitely a schedule that they could take advantage of in this passing game. Uh, I would spend probably, again, between maybe 5 and $10 on Geronimo Allison. And we move to the last two wide receivers. Now, I have Philip Dorsett on here, but I wrote this prior to the news that Gordon was being traded to the Patriots. Obviously, that's a big hit. If you missed my uh, breakdown of Josh Gordon Going to the Patriots, I did an individual video just covering that yesterday, so just go to my channel, or if you're on the podcast, just go to my, my podcast, and it'll be the last video that was put up, so go check that out if you want to hear my thoughts on that. Obviously, this is a big hit to, um, this is a big hit to Philip Dorsett, and it's a hit to Chris Hogan. Now, Philip Dorsett's been almost a full-time player at this point, and he's put together back-to-back -to -back big games, but again, this is going to hurt him, and I don't know how much time he's going to get with Josh Gordon here. However, I would say since Edelman is going to be out for the next two games, I don't know how quickly Josh Gordon gets, uh, you know, into this offense and really gets rolling here. They play at Detroit, Miami at home, Indianapolis at home, KC at home. Now, Brady should absolutely destroy the next month of the schedule. So uh, that could be, you know, Dorsett could definitely be capable of having two, uh, the next two games be big games for him as Edelman is still suspended and Josh Gordon probably won't be a full-time player yet. So he's not someone I'm going to break the, uh, the bank on right now. 
um, because there's a lot of uncertainty when Edelman and Gordon return or come, you know, and join the team. Uh, but the next couple matchups are really good for Dorsett in this passing game. So he's someone that you could probably, you know, get a spot start from in, in, in flex and PPR leagues. I'd probably spend somewhere between 3 and $5 on Dorsett. And the last wide receiver on this list is Tyler Boyd, Cincinnati Bengals, owned in 4% of Yahoo leagues right now. While a lot of people probably thought a different Cincinnati Bengals wide receiver would emerge into 2018 as a real fantasy asset, going by the name of John Ross, Tyler Boyd is shaping up to be the actual wide receiver to own outside of A.J. Green in this offense. Now, in week two, Tyler Boyd caught six of nine targets for 91 yards and a touchdown. This was on Thursday Night Football. Um, The receptions, the targets, and yards all tied career highs for Tyler Boyd. Now, he had a promising rookie year, if you guys don't remember him, back in 2016. Got 54 passes for 603 yards, but he fell off the face of the earth in 2017. Um, He had a sprained MCL that cost him six games, and it also lingered throughout the rest of the game. So, it just kind of held him down and limited him throughout the season. So, he kind of fell off, and then John Ross obviously got a lot of hype, and Tyler Boyd kind of fell behind the wayside. But... So far this year, Tyler Boyd has outsnapped John Ross in both of Cincinnati's games, and he's outsnapped him on the year 102, 107 to 82. So 25 more snaps, and Boyd quietly has a 20, uh, 20% target share in this offense, as well as 35% air yard share, which is kind of crazy. That's a very high number. Um, John Ross sits at 9% of the target shares and 12% of the air yard share in those categories, respectively. So Tyler Boyd is pretty much topping John Ross in every statistical category as well as usage. So they got a tough couple of matchups, the Bengals do, uh, traveling to Carolina and traveling to Atlanta over the next two. But after that, they get a ridiculously good slate of games for uh, passing defense-wise. Um, he's a deeper league ad in PPR leagues, and uh, when Dalton is expected to go off, Tyler Boyd should have a pretty good game. Um, after Atlanta, they have Miami at home, Pittsburgh at home, at Kansas City, Tampa Bay at home. So the next two games might be tough, but after that, you could, you know, this is someone maybe to just keep of uh, keep a note of in your mind and maybe come back to after uh, after they play at Carolina or at Atlanta. I probably spend between two and five dollars on Boyd at this point because he's much more of a deeper league ad. And we're gonna move to the tight end position. Before we do so, we have to thank sponsor for today's video. Y'all know how it is. Y'all know who it is. Y'all know what it is. Fantasyjocks.com. You know, they make these belts. They make these rings. They make trophies for your fantasy football league, as well as fantasy basketball, as well as fantasy baseball, all that kind of stuff. They have the highest quality gear that I've seen in the industry thus far. They are FSTA, Fantasy Sports Trade Association, winners for um, the best fantasy football trophies. So they are not only rated highly by your boy, but they're rated highly by the world. I'm telling you, you're not going to find a better product elsewhere, and there's so much better playing for something in your league rather than just a buy-in. Have everyone throw 5 10 13 bucks on top of the buy-in, and y'all will get a belt that you can have the champion's name engraved in on the side, and you'll keep that for years, 5 10 35 years, I don't know. Bro, do what you want, but head over to fantasyjocks.com. Use promo code TAKE10 or Taco Corp for 10% off your orders i just want to thank them for sponsoring today's video and i'm telling y'all y'all are doing yourselves a disservice if you're not buying some of their products tight ends oh my voice is crack tight ends let's try that one more time tight ends baby let's get it tight ends tight ends tight ends tight ends. so honestly i was looking at the list and i'm not sure there's a tight end on there owned in less than 55 percent of yahoo leagues that i'm even remotely feeling good about telling you guys to grab now i know people are like up in arms about Jonu smith and his zero catch performance but guys i literally said like if marcus mariota is not playing you're not playing Jonu smith he's a he's he's a guy that's super athletic super high metrics but you're stashing him on your bench in the hopes that when mariota returns you know he gains a chemistry like he had with delaney walker um, the good part about Sunday for Jonu Smith's sake is that he played on 100% of the Titans snaps. He played in all 59 of their offensive snaps. So when Mariota returns, which I expect to be next week, he was really close to playing this week, um, S- Smith will be an every snap player, and he should get a lot more looks. Now, we have Jesse James, who had a monster day. He caught all five of his targets in Pittsburgh for 138 yards and a score on a day where Big Ben threw for 452 yards, which is kind of crazy. Um... Sunday also was just the second time in Jesse James's career that he has gone over 60 yards receiving out of uh, 37 career games. So it's not something you should come to expect. And surprisingly, it came on a day when Vance McDonald actually returned to the lineup. Um, and James outsnapped him 45 to 37, but it's almost a tight end by committee right now. Um, so you can't start either of them with confidence. And uh, I'm, I'm probably staying away from the situation because they'll just eat at each other. 
and you don't expect that kind of production coming from Jesse James on a weekly basis. Definitely not. So can't, you know, confidently tell you to start him. Uh, any, either of those guys, Ian Thomas saw just three targets in Greg Olson's absence. So you can't, you can't feel good about starting him. I mean, the tight end spot is really ugly right now. I know Eric Ebron and Ben Watson are owned in just about 55% of Yahoo League. So I didn't really want to throw them on the list, but I would take either of those two in place of any of the guys that I've named so far. Um, Eric Ebron and Ben Watson again, that is, if you missed it, um, Watson and Eric Ebron so so far. They both have seven catches on nine targets, so decent PPR floors. Ebron has 77 yards and obviously the two touchdowns. Watson has 63 yards and zero touchdowns. Should have had a touchdown yesterday. Breeze somehow overthrew him on a fucking wide open end. I was so pissed because I streamed Watson in a lot of my leagues. Um, and actually, just one of my leagues, but... Either way, having him in the lineup, you want to see the breeze overthrew him on like a one yard touchdown, perfect lob. He was literally wide open and he just overthrew him out of the end zone. Something you see breeze make that throw 99 out of 40 times. So Watson, uh, although the box scores haven't been there, I still have confidence he's going to finish the year as, you know, a a solid high end tight end two, if not a a low end tight end one. But yeah, dude, I, I just like. There is, I, I, I really can't help you out at tight end, guys. There's really not much. There's slim pickings here. So you're going to have to get lucky and hopefully grab someone who uh, who scores a touchdown next week if you are just streaming tight ends. Just just the way she goes sometimes. Just the way she goes. And as promised, I will be including uh, defensive streamers in this section as well going forward because I forgot to put that in last time. Last week, my favorite streamer was the New York Jets. Um, they obviously lost their game, but they ended up putting up, I think, like 10 fantasy points. So they were a good streaming option. And as I always say, I look for three things when I'm streaming defenses. It is that they are favorites to win the game. You always want to stream a defense that is favored to win the game. I like to play teams that are at home, and I like to play teams in which the games, uh, the over-under for the games per Vegas is a low number. So those are the three things I look for. Favorites, at home, low over-under. This week, two teams in particular stand out to me that fit those criteria. First of which is the Carolina Panthers versus the Cincinnati Bengals. So Carolina is at home against Cincinnati. And somehow they are only owned in 50% of leagues. I mean, I guess I'm not that surprised given that they just got beat up on by the Falcons. Um, But they're back at home in week three. And I expect a similar performance from the Panthers uh, like they had in week one when they were at home against Dallas. They managed six sacks and allowed just eight points to the Cowboys. Uh, again, Carolina is favored by three points in this game over the Bengals. The over/under is 43 and a half, which is a pretty low number. So I'd spend you know two to three dollars, and they're probably my favorite streaming option that is available in less than 55% of leagues. In deeper leagues, my favorite streaming option would be Miami Dolphins versus the Oakland Raiders. They are owned in two percent of Yahoo leagues, so pretty much everyone watching this video can probably grab the Miami Dolphins. Now they've been one of the bigger surprises of the year so far. They're sitting at two and zero atop the AFC East. I mean, don't get fucking used to it, Miami fans, but they have strung together back-to-back games where they've put up 13 fantasy points each. Um, and that's thanks to five interceptions on the year. Now they'll take on an 0-2 Oakland team coming off a three-interception game by uh, their quarterback, Derek Carr. Now, admittedly, this Raider team has actually looked a lot better um, led by Gruden and led, led by Derek Carr than I had anticipated. I know they're 0-2, but they've looked pretty good so far. But again, the Dolphins fit my streaming rules. They are at home. They are favorites in this game, and the over-under total is at 44 and a half. So if, you know, if you're desperate for a streamer, Miami would definitely be uh, one of the teams I would be looking to do that with. And that is going to wrap up the waiver wire video for this week, homies. I'm sure I forgot some people um, that y'all might want to pick up. But that's going to be it. So give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed, if you got some value from it. Uh, Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Wednesday's video will be, or Thursday's video will be the fan submitted question and answer. If you want to submit a question, you could head to facebook.com slash bdge fantasy football and just like the page and submit a question through the messenger on Facebook. And maybe your question will get featured on Thursday's video. Saturday will be my top DFS plays of the week. And Sunday, as always, will be live streams leading up to the game. Make sure you hit that bell underneath the video so you got notifications whenever the uh, whenever, whenever, whenever I go live, which is on usually at 11.30 a.m. Eastern time before kickoff on Sundays. That's going to be it. And I'll see you all on Thursday. So peace.